All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining, in a, joining us on a virtual tour of our Lancaster Water Reclamation Plant. Every year, we look forward to showing off the Lancaster plant. Um, we usually um, have a bus and some of our, 100 of our closest friends um, meet us at the treatment plant and we drive around or walk around. Um, but the world has changed a little bit and we've tried to adjust to it. And so today we're gonna to give you a virtual tour of our Lancaster water reclamation plant. I'm Basil Hewitt, an engineer with Sanitation Districts. We also have Genesis Rodriguez, uh, uh, public, affairs official, uh, public affairs specialist in our public information office. She'll be the moderator of this tour. She'll also be filling your questions. So please put your questions in the Q&A or raise your hand and she, at the appropriate time, she'll ask John or I your question. Um, we also have John Dahl, who's been here um, in our, at our Lancaster and Palmdale water, rec water reclamation plant. And we also have Teresa May, who's a treatment plant operator. With that, let's, let's start the tour. Uh, the sanitation district was formed in 1923. This is an actual picture of raw sewage going into the Santa Monica Bay in 19 in the early 1920s um, raw sewage was discharged into our rivers and our ocean and it resulted in life expectancy um, of about 50 or 55 years of age and people realized that hey we're spreading disease with this raw sewage we need to do something about it so folks got together they wrote a law they passed a law um, that created the sanitation districts and so we were formed in 1923 and from that, those humble beginning, we we're off and running. We now have, have 24 sanitation districts. Uh, next slide, please. And you can see them here, 24 sanitation districts. And John, if you could use your cursor, point out the sanitation districts. We serve about 5.6 million people as far south as Long Beach, um, Santa Cruz Valley, and the Antelope Valley. And our our northernmost sanitation district is Sanitation Districts 14, and we'll talk about this slide a little bit. Uh, district 14 serves the city of Lancaster, a uh, small portion of the city of Palmdale, and unincorporated LA County, mainly the Quartz Hills area. So our board of directors for Sanitation District 14, the mayor of Lancaster, the mayor of Palmdale, and the chairperson of LA County Board of Supervisors. And the neat thing about this setup is that even though we, we, we serve 5.6 million people and it has great, um, we leverage that in terms of buying resources, we get the best price. Our staff time is split between the 24 uh, sanitation district. But we also get local control because your mayor, your supervisor, they bring your local issue to bear at each of these sanitation districts meeting. Uh, next image, please. And so here's a great shot of the topography of LA County. And if you notice uh, these pins represent our 11 wastewater treatment plant. And these 11 wastewater treatment plant um, treat about 400 million gallons of sewage a day. That's enough sewage to, to fill the Rose Bowl four or five times a day. Today, we're gonna focus on one of our two treatment plants in the Antelope Valley. And we'll see a pin pop up to kind of to orient us. And so today we're going to get a close-up and personal view of the Lancaster Water Reclamation Plant. Next image, please. Those two plants in Antelope Valley, Lancaster and Palmdale, and John can use his cursor and just point out the Lancaster and Palmdale plant, they're in what we call the closed basin. This is an aerial image and it shows you the V-shape, shows you the topography of the Antelope Valley, the high desert. So what happens here is that all the water that hits the ground in the Antelope Valley flows towards Edwards Air Force Base. There's no river or ocean to discharge excess recycled water. Our nine other treatment plants that are, that are on the other side of the mountain, if we have water that people don't need, we've cleaned it up and it's excess, we can discharge it to the ocean or we can discharge it to the river. But we don't have that luxury at the Lancaster plant. Every drop, if we don't account for it, will wind up in Edwards Air Force Base, which isn't such a good thing. So John will take you through the, the treatment process and we'll show you how John and Teresa and all the good men and women of the Lancaster plant 
make sure they not only treat this water to protect public health and the environment, but they have precise accounting for every drop so no extra water winds up on Edwards Air Force Base. With that, take it away, John. Awesome, thank you very much. And, and I'd like to thank everybody for uh, joining us uh, this Saturday morning. Uh, we really appreciate it and we're so glad that you, you can be here with us so we can show you uh, all the work that we do to, to manage your uh, wastewater. And so I encourage you to ask any questions that you may have uh, along the way. Um, this is your tour, we wanna do this for you. So we'll go ahead and start the, uh, treatment. So, uh, so what's wastewater? You can see, you know, it encompasses all these areas. So we have, you know, of course, the toilet, the shower, um, uh, bathtub, and somebody brushing their, their teeth uh, in the sink. Also, we, uh, other sources that contribute to the wastewater, is, it comes from your kitchen and also your laundry room. So there's many different sources within the household that contribute to, um, uh, to your wastewater. And then this slide here shows how the water is conveyed from your home over to the uh, wastewater treatment plant. So it leaves your home in a pipe, connects with a bigger pipe, and then it, it goes on to the uh, treatment plant itself. All right, so here's an overview, a uh, quick little video of the Lancaster treatment plant. In the background, you can see the 14 freeway. This is Avenue D along here. Lancaster sits on a, a, a little more than uh, 500 acres of uh, property, so it's a, a large property for a wastewater treatment plant. Um, <clears throat> it began service in 1959, uh, was recently upgraded to a tertiary treatment plant in uh, approximately 2012. The, the plant itself treats roughly uh, 15 MGD of flow per day on average, 15 MGD. MGD is a unit of measurement, it stands for million, uh, million gallons per day. So uh, just to put a picture in your mind's eye, um, imagine uh, operating your garden hose at home. A garden hose flows about five gallons per minute of flow. So if you take 140 garden hoses and put them all together, that flow equals one MGD. And so multiply that flow by 15, and that's what this plant sees on average for flow. We'll go to the next slide. Oops, sorry about that. Uh, so this is a picture of Teresa. Um, this is the control room, so I thought we'd start here. And <clears throat> what you're looking at in the background here is a screenshot uh, or a screen of the uh, DCS control system. DCS stands for Distributive Control um, uh, System. And so the operators use this to control various um, pumps and valves and things like that throughout the plant. So they don't have to, we don't have to have a, uh, you know, several uh, operators on staff. Uh, we can just have a few operators in control room controlling the plant, and then a few of the operators will go out into the plant to make any adjustments that may be necessary. So if you refer to the screen itself, you can see those different colors on the screen. So some are red and some are green. The red represents that those pumps are off. Green rep represents those pumps are on, or those valves are open. And so with the click of a button, the operator can turn off or on a pump as necessary. And if you look to the left, the screen on the left here shows a graph. And so the operator can look at the graph and see if, there's, uh, if, if that particular system is trending in one direction or another, or if they need to make adjustments to, to the, the process itself. And here's a schematic of the treatment system for the Lancaster plant itself. And, and we're gonna go through all of these. We're basically gonna follow the water through the system. Um, and so we'll start out with the pumps and then move on from there. We're gonna talk about the primary system first, then we're gonna move on to the secondary system and then the tertiary system. So starting out with the uh, primary system here, so you have pumps, uh, start with the pumps and then we go on to the mechanically screened bar screen. Then we go on to the grid chambers, and then we're going to, lastly, we're going to talk about the primary settling tanks before going to the next system. So starting out with the uh, influent pumps, this is a picture of the building itself. The pumps are actually approximately 40 feet below grade, 40 feet down. And the reason why they're so deep is because the Anno Valley is flat, and we want those uh, sewer uh, systems to gravity flow water to the plant. And so in order to gravity flow the water to the plant, we have to uh, slope it towards the plant, which means it gets deeper and deeper as it gets closer to the plant. And so these pumps again are 40 feet below grade. Uh, we have five pumps 
the the range in horsepower from 137 to 150 horsepower and they pump about 10 mgd each each pump pumps about 10 mgd and so here's an overview of the screening structure um, the purpose of the screening structure is to remove uh, large debris in the wastewater itself oh by the way let me back up a second to the uh, inflow pumps so the purpose of the inflow pumps is to pump water up to the screening structure where we can start the tr treatment process itself. That's why we have to raise the water up, not only because it's 40 feet below, but we want to get a little bit higher. Um, so anyway, sorry I missed that earlier. Anyways, so on the screening structure itself, uh, we remove large debris from the wastewater. And so um, here's we're going to screen out larger debris. And then that debris ends up in the, the bins that you see here. Every treatment plant is different depending upon the community it serves. So you can see different, different items that are removed from the uh, screening structure based off of the community that it serves. And here up here in the Antelope Valley, we tend to see a lot of rags and things in our, in our bins. So here's a graphic view of how the screening structure works. So you can see the debris comes along, the screening structure then captures it and then conveys it up and out of the water itself. And it goes over and then it drops it on in this graphic it drops it on to a conveyor we don't have a conveyor at lancaster uh, we have a um, a different system and i'm going to show you that show you that here in a second we have a washer compactor so here's a video of the screen structure you see some rags being pulled out some plastic here so there's different items that are pulled out these are the larger items that we want to remove out of here and then this item these items are then dropped into the um, uh, <clears throat> the grinder, washer compactor, and then into those bins that you saw earlier. And so this is where the materials drop down into this bin right here. It goes through this grinder and then into this washer compactor, which is then the pushes out the material out the side and then down into the bin itself. And here's a close-up video of the, uh, or close-up photograph of the bin itself. And so this is a good time to kind of talk about what we remove. So you can see from this, from this uh, video here, in the left you have toilet paper, and the right we have flush, flushable wipes. You can see the difference, physical difference between the two, where the toilet paper is broken up within the water and the flushable wipes are not, they're still solid. And so this creates issues for our pumps, and this creates a huge load on the uh, wastewater treatment plant itself. So what happens is that these flushable wipes, they can accumulate in the pumps and they'll lock up the pumps. At that point, then we have to remove the pumps uh, disassemble it, clean it out, uh, possibly rebuild it, and then put it back together and put it back into uh, service. And so this is a, an expense on the plant itself, or your plant, I should say. Um, and so <clears throat> when it comes to flushable wipes, uh, it, it's preferable that you don't flush them. It's preferable that you throw them away. I also want to add in that uh, if you have any medications, um, uh, you want to bring those back to the uh, pharmacist for uh, disposal. They'll take it back for free, so you don't want to put that down the drain either. All right, so next we're going to move on to the uh, grit chambers. This is a picture of the grit chambers themselves. So the purpose of the grit chambers is just that, to remove grit um, from the water. So you remove grit, sand, eggshells, smaller dense particles is what we're trying to remove. And the reason why is because we're trying to protect downstream equipment. So this water moves very quickly. So we just settle out those smaller, uh, heavier particles. And then the lighter uh, organic material will continue on downstream. Uh, as you can see, the water's moving very quickly. These, uh, there's four of these uh, channels, if you, are, if you will, here. And they're only five feet deep. And so, um, so up to this point, then we move on to the uh, primary settling tanks. So here's a video of the primary settling tanks themselves. Uh, you see there's six tanks. These two tanks here are only about seven and a half feet deep. The remainder of the tanks are 10 feet deep. And the reason the difference of the, of the depth is because um, of phases. As the, as the plant accepted more water, uh, we expanded. And, and, and when we expanded, we made the tanks a little bit deeper. Excuse me. So in this process, I'm sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Um, so there, we have a couple questions about the wipes mm -hmm. down, the, down the sewer system. Do these wipes have any warning systems or is there something that we're doing to combat against uh, flushing these wipes down the drain? 
Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. I, and I appreciate you asking that. So um, <clears throat> I, I personally have not seen any warnings on any, uh, any of the boxes that I've seen in the, in the grocery stores that have these flushable wipes. Um, technically, they are quote unquote flushable. You can flush them. It doesn't mean that you should flush them. Uh, I have read on some articles that some cities are looking to ban them in their cities, but there's no, uh, I didn't see anything on the state level or, or federal level on, on banning them. And so some of the cities have, have, have taken action to uh, remove these off their shelves or are looking to take action, remove these off the, the shelves of, of the local uh, wastewater, uh, the area that the wastewater tra treatment plant serves in order to protect the plant a little bit. But that's a great question, I appreciate it. Okay, so um, going back to the uh, primary settling tanks. And so this is where we slow the water way down. And the reason why is we want to uh, remove the um, <clears throat> material that's in the water uh, by either floating it or sinking it. So it's either gonna float or sink. And so we'll have scrapers that run up the top and the bottom, and I'll, and I'll show that to you in here in a second, that, that uh, remove the material. And so here's a, a close-up picture of what some of the material it is that we're removing. See, there's some grease here. There's some, looks like some paper or plastic at the top also. And this board here that you see running along the side here. So that's, that's what slowly goes along the, the water surface itself. It collects this material, pushes it to the end where we collect it and remove it at that point. And so here's the inside look of what a primary settling tank may look like. So here are these boards that you saw a picture of, they're below and they're also above, and there's also these chains here. And so if you remember from the grit chamber, we remove a lot of that grit, that sandy material, and that's protect these uh, straight chain and sprockets and other uh, downstream equipment. And so these, uh, these, um, <clears throat> these uh, chain and flight systems, they just go around and around, and they collect everything that floats and then everything on the bottom also. And I have a graphic showing, uh, showing it, how it works. So you can see the sludge being collected over here at the bottom, and then, and then the material being collected on the top. And the water spends about an hour in this system. Just kind of lets you know how slow it goes. It goes real slow. And that's the scum being collected on the top. Okay, and then we also want to show you a picture of the uh, primary um, gallery. So this is, this is below grade. Right here on the left, this wall, these are actually the primary tanks themselves. These pipes, they collect all the, the sludge that collects at the bottom. So these pipes that come out of the concrete structures collect that sludge and then they're pumped down onto the digesters. And we're going to talk about the digesters in a little bit. But we kind of want to show you how uh, that sludge is um, uh, transported uh, or, or removed from the system. This video shows the, what the water looks like as it's coming over the years. And so we have these, these weirs here to kind of slowly bring the water off of the, um, the tanks themselves. We don't want to create any, any eddies or any currents. And the reason why is we're trying to get stuff to settle out as much as we can. So we slow the water down as much as we can. And that's why we have those, those, those weirs there, which slowly pull water off of the water surface. Okay, so we just finished looking at the primary settling tanks here. Next, we're gonna go on to the biological tanks and then the secondary settling tanks. And then we're gonna move on to the solids. All right, so here's a photograph of our uh, biological tanks. We have nine tanks. They're 19 feet deep. Uh, the water spends about um, <clears throat> four hours in the system before going on to the next, next process itself. Uh, at Lancaster, we have a, a nitrification, a denitrification process. And, and the purpose of the NDN process is to remove ammonia and to remove nitrogen. And so, You'll, so if you look at the tanks, this might be a little bit difficult to see in this photograph here, but you'll see some areas are, are aerated, these bubbling, they'll be bubbling here, and then some are not. And the reason for that is that we were selecting certain microbes to do certain work for us. So we, we're selecting microbes to do the nitri nitrification process, 
And then after that, we're selecting microbes to do the denitrification process. And so we want to remove this ammonia because it's, um, <clears throat> it's poisonous to the aquatic environment. And then we want to want to remove the uh, nitrates uh, from the system as well because uh, it, it's not uh, it, it's a pollutant as well. And eventually, this transforms into nitrogen gas, which is not a a, a pollutant. And so here's a video of the system itself. You can see the bubbles on the right here. On the left, you see lack of bubbles. And you also see these boards going across, and these are just to separate zones. Excuse me. John, yes. can you tell us about how much water we receive a day at this plant? So the average flow at Lancaster is uh, 15 million gallons a day. 15 MGD is the average flow. We'll see a spike in flow uh, over uh, Thanksgiving. And the reason for that is because everybody's home, there's a lot, a lot of human activity going on. People are cooking, using the restrooms, uh, that sort of thing. And so we see an influx of flow uh, during, uh, during Thanksgiving. We also see an influx of flow during uh, the Super Bowl. And um, <clears throat> you can even, actually, if you're sitting in the control room, if you remember back uh, earlier on in the presentation, there's a picture of uh, Teresa and she's in front of the, the, um, the DCS screen and you can see the graphic on the left. There's also a graphic for the flow. And so um, during Super Bowl, you can actually see it kind of spike up during halftime and then, and then go back down. And so it's kind of interesting to see, uh, see that. So yeah, about 15 uh, MGD is the average flow for and, and did you see an influx in flow when COVID quarantine was instated? Um, that's that's a good question. I recall seeing that the flow was pretty much the same or nearly the same as it was uh, pre-COVID. Uh, I I remember we looked at that briefly, and it was it went up maybe just a tick, but overall it was pretty much the same flows that we had. So uh, yeah, not a not a huge difference, um, but maybe a minor difference, maybe a minor difference. And uh, you talked about the pumping station that pumps the water up to the surface. What happens when you lose power at that pumping station? Oh, that's that's a great question too, and I appreciate that. So <clears throat> at, at all our wastewater uh, facilities, we have backups. Um, we never have we ne we don't like to have a a um, a, a critical function that could fail and then and then possibly cause issues with the plant itself. And so to answer your question, if we should lose power at the plant, we have backup generators that automatically kick on like within within seconds. It'll come back on, it'll kick on, alarms will go out. Um, if the operators are not on station at the at the time, uh, they'll get phone calls and they'll drive into the plant and they'll and they'll they'll uh, make any adjustments that may be necessary and inspect the plant. So so yes, we, we do have backup systems. The, um, the uh, primary inflow pumps themselves, um, <clears throat> uh, we have five pumps. They each pump about 10 MGD. And so if we got an average flow with 15 MGD, we only need, you know, technically one and a half pumps. So we only run two pumps at a time uh, out of those five uh, pumps. So we have backup pumps. So if any of our pumps get clogged up with those flushable wipes like we talked about, and we have to pull a pump out, um, we have redundancy in the system too. So that way we can continue to serve the, uh, the community. But yeah, that was a great question. I appreciate that. Okay, thank you. All right, so here's a close up of the uh, biological process itself. This is the aerated zone. We're bubbling in air and oxygen for the microbes. I know, by the way, um, and I'll talk in a second here too, but loud with the sound. Okay, and here's a, a graphic of uh, activated sludge. So if you can see the aeration going on and the sludge is being recycled back through. So I wanted to also mention, here's, here's a microbe, a uh, video of a microbe itself. There's many different types of microbes in there. The reason why we use the microbes is that they remove the dissolved uh, waste in the water itself. So on the um, <clears throat> primary tanks and the uh, grit chambers and the screens, those are all physical processes to remove um, what's in the water itself. 
And so once we remove everything that we can uh, in the water physically, we then turn it over to these uh, microbes, uh, commonly referred to as bugs, to eat the waste that's in the, in the water itself. And so they go in and they eat the waste and that we use them to clean the water. And uh, we have a diverse set of microorganisms out there in the plant uh, or in that process that removes the waste because there's many different types of waste. There's not just one type of waste out there. There's many different types. And so we wanna remove all the waste that we can out of the water uh, using these microbes. And they do a very, very good job of it. And have there ever been an accident in which you get the wrong microbes? Uh, no, no, um, no. So we, <clears throat> um, so the microbes, they live in that system and, and the operators basically care and feed for them, if you will, by controlling the processes, how, you know, what, you know, how much air is applied uh, based off the flow. They're, they're always constantly making adjustments so that they're, they're happy in, in the environment. And, and when they're happy, then they're consuming the waste and they're removing it out of the water uh, and for us. Um, I also want to mention that it's, it's not really, when you look at wastewater, people say, oh, yuck, that's disgusting. But it's really not the water that's bad. It's what's in the water that, that, that's not healthy for us. And so the water itself is good. And we want to take that good portion out of, of that um, waste stream and remove all the bad stuff. So the treatment plant itself just removes everything that's bad in the water, uh, leaving clean water behind it that we can reuse for, for other purposes. Yeah, my favorite question, someone asked, what does it smell like? Oh, okay, yeah, so. We can't uh, be there in person, so describe it for us. <laughs> okay, um, yes, it, yes, so on the, on the in-person, the physical tour itself, um, when you start out in the tour, we, we, we go in the same direction, or same process that we're doing now. We'll start out with the screening structure, then we'll go to the grid chamber, and then on the primary tanks. In those areas, uh, the water uh, does, it, it is a little odorous. It does kind of stink. Um, and so um, you, you, do, you do smell it, especially if you're not used to it, you definitely smell it. Uh, but then after that point, it gets cleaner and cleaner and cleaner. So like when you get to the biological tanks, you can still smell an odor, but it's not very, very prominent. It's not very prominent at all. And then by the time you get to the, the secondary settling tanks, and, and as you go along the treatment process, it gets, cleaner and cleaner and cleaner and, and it, it doesn't uh, smell uh, bad at all. And has someone ever fallen in? And if so, what do you do? Um, I am not aware of anybody falling in. Um, I'm sh maybe it's happened, I'm sure it's happened somewhere, uh, but I'm not aware of anybody falling in. So if that, if that happens, then um, <clears throat> you, know, you just rescue the person, take the person out and, and um, you, you clean yourself off. We usually, um, so like if you end up falling in, say the the uh, biological tanks, there's a lot of microbes in there and that sort of thing. And so in that case, uh, the person will clean themselves up, maybe take a shower at the plant and then uh, just take them for a checkup at the hospital and, and possibly follow up after that point. That, that's, pro that's generally the process that we'll follow. Okay, this is, thank you. Uh, this is a good question. Um, th since the tanks seem to be outdoors, what happens if we experience rain or snow, et cetera? Okay, great. Yeah, so uh, to first address the rain question, uh, rain has uh, little effect on the treatment, uh, treatment process itself. Um, we may see a little bit of an uptick in flow just because of uh, infiltration into our sewers uh, with water ponding on the streets and that sort of thing. But uh, but that's about the biggest effect that uh, that we that we typically see. Um, as far as the snow goes, uh, same very little effect there as well. Uh, wastewater enters the plant at about roughly 70 degrees. Uh, it may get a little, just a tick cooler in the winter time, uh, but it's about 70 degrees, so it's it's warm enough to where the microbes uh, are still fine. Uh, there's no uh, no um, uh, uh, freezing in the treatment process itself. Now, some of the pipes above ground will will insulate to protect them uh, from freezing, and and that's pretty much about it. But as far as weather goes, we're you know we're pretty much set up where it, it doesn't really have a a huge effect on on the process itself. We're pretty on top of things. Cool. And I think um, Teresa, our 
treatment plan operator wanted to mention something about the about the rails. Teresa. Ah, uh, she you're muted, Teresa. Sorry. Uh, oh, that's weird. We can't seem to hear you. Um, but so Teresa wanted to mention that there are safety rails around all the tanks and the primary tanks also have nets over them. Yes, and that's a very good point. We do, <clears throat> we do have a safety group within the sanitation districts and we perform regular safety inspections on our plants. And, um, and so we go through and anything that, that anybody has a concern with the safety issue with, they'll bring it up and then we address it at that point. And so uh, we, we do have a pretty good robust uh, safety program at the plant. Okay, um, so is water softener used or is the water hard? Um, how does the debris from the water softener like salt affect the system? Uh, in our case, uh, uh, we don't see any effect from that. Um, we, ha we, we don't have any issues with water softeners up in the Antelope Valley. They are, they are uh, homeowners are permitted to use them. Okay, cool. And I'll lead you to your next question, which you're going to talk about is how the microbes are separated from the water once it's cleaned. Awesome. Thank you. So yes, yeah, so the next system we're going to go to is the secondary settling system. And here's an overview uh, of itself. <clears throat> so just like the primary system, settling system, the secondary system is very similar. This is where we slow the water way down to settle out these microbes. And lucky for us, these microbes are just a, just a touch heavier than, than water than, themselves. And so, so these tanks themselves are uh, about 15 feet deep and the water spends about two hours in them uh, before, um, you know, to help settle out the microbes. And I think we have a, yep, we got a video of it. So we'll show you a video of it. And this stage, this is where you can really see a difference in the water. Uh, maybe not so much in the, in the video, but it's, it's a lot cleaner at this point. We do have a, a, a video showing the, the, um, the water coming over the weirs at the end, which we'll show you here in a second. And in the background, you can see the 14 freeway. So it's kind of a, kind of a neat, neat view. Um, and here's inside the secondary clarifier, just like the primaries, you see the boards that go across, we have these chains here. And just like the primaries, it just rotates around and collects everything that, that uh, either floats or sinks in the tanks themselves. And here's a video of the clarifiers. You can see the water's pretty clean as it, as it comes out here. Uh, and we're not even done with the treatment process itself. And we have these, these weirs are a little bit shaped, are shaped a little bit different than the primary tanks. They kind of look like alligator teeth. And they have the same purpose as the primary tanks do. We want to we slowly scalp the water off of the tanks. We don't want to create any, um, any eddies or, or flow or, or ice flows or anything like that. Um, it, we want the microbes to settle out and, and that's what we do in this stage. All right, so um, with those settle out microbes, um, so, okay, so I'm gonna back up a little bit. In the biological tanks, we're providing them food and we're providing them water. Uh, they're very happy. And so what happens at that point is that they tend to uh, multiply, uh, procreate. And so they just continue growing and growing. So some of those microbes, we, we pump back into the tanks in order to maintain the population. But the excess microbes, uh, we then send off to um, uh, the dissolved air flotation tank and then onto the digester for processing. So, so we do what you call wasting them uh, at that point. And so next we're going to move on to the dissolved air flotation tanks. So here's an overview of the uh, dissolved air flotation tanks and their purpose is to remove the excess water out of the uh, microbes that we settled out in the secondary process. Um, in these tanks you can see the covers have been removed along here and that's just so the operators can can come in and inspect the system to make sure it's operating uh, correctly. And I have a little bit of video, or a little video here I want to show you. So how the system works is that air is bubbled up through the, through the tanks itself, and you kind of see on the left-hand side the water and the bubbles, a little bit. 
And so these bubbles carry up the uh, solids to the top, and then the scraper that you saw moving collects it and then drops it into a trough, and then from there it's pumped over to the digesters. And so next we'll move on to the digesters. So here's a uh, overview of our digesters. We have eight digesters <clears throat> on site, and then and below you see some uh, bacteria over here. So we have microbes in our digesters as well. Now the purpose of the digesters is to uh, reduce the volume, reduce odor, and, um, re and eliminate any um, pathogens that can cause disease. So you may notice on some of these digesters, there are uh, a bunch of different pipes. I'll just use this one here as an example. These are our newest digesters, digester seven and eight over here. So the pipes serve different purposes. Some of them are uh, transporting material into the digester, some transporting material out. Um, some are um, uh, provide, uh, collecting gas because they produce uh, uh, a gas, methane, uh, which is then used to reheat the digesters. And then um, others are used to um, inject steam into the digester to heat them up. And so these digesters are maintained about 100 degrees and the sludge spends about 30 days in these digesters before going on to the next process. Cool, I have a question. Um, is industrial wastewater a challenge for treatment and do industries do any pre-treatment prior to releasing their wastewater to us? Yeah, so that's a great question as well. There's, <clears throat> there's uh, as you know, there's art industries out there uh, that do different things and they have um, various wastes. And so the sanitation districts has an industrial waste program. So let's say you're gonna start up a business as a, um, uh, I don't know, a, a plater. You know, you're gonna, you're gonna put chrome plating on, on bumpers. So as a business, you, you make application, uh, the sanitation district's uh, representative may come out and say, okay, w you know, we need your waste to be, uh, to have these certain parameters in it. In other words, you know, you, got, you, ha you can't discharge uh, metals into the uh, sewers or there's only so many, you know, they, they establish the limits is what it is. And so then at that point, the, the owner will either have an on-site on uh, pre-treatment system himself um, uh, or, or, the, or they could possibly discharge it into the sewer depending upon the uh, concentration of the waste. So it, it is monitored and we also have uh, samplers uh, throughout the city as well at various locations uh, in the sewers. And so they'll sample uh, the water and they'll analyze it to, to make sure that we're, you know, receiving the waste that we're expecting to receive. And that helps, helps with the plan as well, it helps the operators because uh, they, you know, if you have a steady state system, it's much easier to, to manage than if something uh, changes drastically from one, one day to the next or hour to hour. And uh, one question before we move on. How long does it take for the microbes to eat the solids? Oh, yes. Um, thank you. So the micro, the water spends about four hours on average in, in the biological system to, to remove the waste. Yes, thank you for asking that. Okay, we're good. Okay, awesome. All right, so so after uh, the sludge has spent 30 days in the digesters, uh, we then pump it over to the dewatering building. Uh, these are centrifuges that you see here, and I have a, 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 a graphic of it or video of it here in a second. And so the purpose of, of the of the system is to reduce volume and reduce weight, weight of the biosolids. So, um, <clears throat> and how the system works is, here you can see the sludge will come into the, the centrifuge and then it gets pushed to the outside. And then the solids will then go forward and then drop out here. And then the water would be pushed out the back and then and drop out there. This water is called uh, centrate, by the way. And, and so, um, <clears throat> by doing this, this re reduces the, the water weight of the biosolids, and um, it also reduces volume at the same time, uh, and which saves on costs. Okay, so and here's a uh, video of the biosolids itself. Uh, our, our beds are getting a little full here, um, and so we, we actually did transport the solids off after that, but we're going to go ahead and zoom in on the biosolids so you can kind of see what they look like. Um, if you're here for the physical tour, uh, 
you know, normally I'll, I'll grab a sample of this and, and, and let you kind of hold it if you wanted to. Some people do, some people don't. And so just to give you an idea of the texture of it, it's, it's kind of like uh, Play-Doh or even that um, sand that kids play with, a kind of sticky sand, I'm not sure what it's called. Uh, so it's, it's pliable, um, it's not wet, but it's not dry either. And so then the biosols are then uh, trucked off site to a composting facility where they compost the uh, biosols for, for reuse. Okay. Can you tell us what would happen to, what would happen if we didn't remove the pneumonia and nitrogen in the secondary system? Yeah, so, um, so the ammonia is considered uh, uh, poisonous to the aquatic environment. And so uh, we want to remove that. It's a pollutant. It's a pollutant in the wastewater uh, system. So we want to remove it. And we use the microbes to, to do that for us. And um, <clears throat> the um, nitrogen, uh, I'm sorry, the um, nitrogen that, that it converts it to, uh, or nitrate and nitrate, is is an issue well it can create um uh issues for human health and and also it's it could grow um uh it it, it create it create uh, i'm trying to think in the back of my head um some examples for you but um had maybe you've heard of this the the a blue baby syndrome and so what that is is that if you if you um if these nitrates or nitrites get into the system into your drinking water, if you will, uh, and you consume it, it, it could, it could uh, prevent or limit the oxygen transfer uh, in the human body or, or minimize it. And, and that's where that uh, blue baby syndrome terminology comes from. And so that's why we want to uh, convert the ammonia to remove it out of the system. And then once we convert it to nitrate nitrate, we want to convert it further onto nitrogen gas where it's no longer a pollutant and no longer um, uh, ha has a negative effect on uh, on our ecosystem or on on people. Thank you. Um, before we move on to tertiary, how is something like Listerine mouthwash or something that isn't at least eighty percent water filtered out? Um, <clears throat> I'm sorry. So, well, so if so, I imagine I'm guessing the question is, hey, if we use Listerine, is that create an issue with the water with the wastewater treatment plant? Is that the question? Um, it, it does not say. I, I, maybe I, maybe I don't understand the question, but, um, using Listerine, uh, and, and putting in the sewers, uh, it's such a, uh, small amount in volume compared to the water itself. It doesn't create an issue within the treatment system. So it, it, it's safe to use. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay, great. All right, so next we'll move on to the uh, tertiary system. So <clears throat> we're gonna talk a little bit about the uh, secondary effluent basins, then we're gonna move on to the gravity filters and then the chlorine contact tanks. Um, and, then, and then on to uh, the reuse and, and Basil will continue on the tour at that point. So here's a photograph of our um, equalization basins. Uh, we got one basin here that has water in it and we got one to the left which doesn't have water. And it, this, these basins combined hold about 5 million gallons. The purpose of the basins are, are twofold. One, to uh, provide emergency storage if needed. So like, uh, remember earlier, I talked a little bit about redundancy. So this is kind of part of that redundancy system. So if there's issues with the downstream, downstream processes, we could divert water to these basins for a short period of time if we need, need to. Uh, the second purpose of it is to equalize the flow. So <clears throat> throughout the day, water will, will flow up and down uh, depending upon usage. So like when people get up in the morning, you'll, and they start showering and cooking, that sort of thing, the flow will go up. And then during the day, when people go to work, uh, the flow will go down a little bit because there's less human activity. And then when they come home at night, then it'll go back up again. And so you have this up and down uh, flow that happens throughout the day. Well, this, what this equalization basin does is it equalizes that, that flow on the, on the second half of the plant. And the reason why you want to do that is because when you get to the chlorination uh, part of the treatment, um, the operators will set a certain amount of chlorine to be um, 
added to the water in order to get the disinfection that they're looking for. And if that flow is going up and down, they're always kind of chasing it. And by chasing it, um, you tend to um, over chlorinate than under chlorinate because you want to be safe. Uh, and so that reduces the risk. And so when you have a steady state flow, the operators can then more accurately dial in how much um, uh, chemical they want to apply in the process in order to disinfect the water. So it's, it's also a cost savings approach. Okay, so the next in the process is the uh, filtration. And this is an overview of the, um, of the gravity filter itself. And so these, uh, and I'll go back here a second. Uh, let me see, no, it's good. So these gravity filters, the tanks are about 25 feet deep, just to give you an idea. And, and these filters, uh, how, how they work is, uh, and I got a graphic here. Oops. So the water will come in, as you saw in the, in the previous video, and then it'll flow through some coal, anthracite coal, and then it'll go through some sand and gravel. So it filters it out. And then from there, it, gets, it goes on for, to the disinfection process itself. And so this is basically a, a, a polishing, if you will, uh, of the water before it goes to the um, disinfection process. All right, so here's a uh, overview of the, of the disinfection tanks. This is where we add uh, a chlorine to disinfect uh, the tanks. So the water uh, spends about three hours in the system, and these tanks are about 18 feet deep. Now, the reason why you can't see the tanks, obviously, is because we have covers over them. We don't have covers at, generally speak, we don't have covers anywhere else in the plant. The reason why these are covered is because um, we want to uh, protect the chlorine from the sun. We don't want it to evaporate. And so if you have, happen to have a pool at home, you know what I'm talking about. In the summertime, you got to add a lot of chlorine to the pool in order to get uh, the levels you want. But during the wintertime, when there's less sun, you don't add as, as much uh, chlorine. And so that's why we cover them. We cover them as a cost savings uh, measure. And I got a video here next, I'll show you of the water coming out of the uh, disinfection process. So you can see it's very clean at this point. Uh, this, is, this is where the water's been completely clean and it's it's very very clean and if you were standing here somebody asked earlier what what the smells are like so if you were standing here it would smell very much like a swimming pool it smelled very clean and here's a picture comparing the start of the process to the end of the process so this is our raw wastewater what it looks like when it first came in and this is what it looks like when it uh, leaves the plant and so that concludes the talk about the plant itself and now I'm going to hand it over to uh, uh, Basil to continue on with the tour. Before we leave the plant though, um, does the plant have to be watched 24-7? Um, you know, so that's another great question I appreciate. So no, the, our plants do not have to be watched 24-7 or, or I should say physically managed 24-7. We just operate on an eight-hour uh, schedule. And this is where that DCS system comes into play. So because we have that DCS system, we don't need operators here 24 seven to watch over the plant. Uh, so they, they work a normal eight hour shift and then uh, the DCS system will sort of control the plant, if you will, uh, during the evening hours. And <clears throat> at that point, so if something should go wrong, like say at midnight, something should go out of whack or you know, there's certain parameters, parameters that are set uh, for each system and if something starts to go you know a little awry an alarm will go out and they'll call out to the operators and it'll it'll continue to call out until somebody picks up the phone and 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 physically acknowledges the alarm and when that person acknowledges the alarm then they drive into the plant and then they look at the system and then they, they make any adjustments that may be necessary at that point Okay, and um, when recycling water, is the conversion completely recycled? Uh, you mentioned 15 million a day comes in. How much goes out, or is there some water lost in the conversion? Yeah, so we, 100% we, uh, of the water uh, um, 
hundred percent of the water that comes in goes goes out the the other end. So we don't we don't lose water per se in the corrosion itself. Okay. It doesn't go any anywhere else, but uh, but within the treatment plant itself or uh, um, uh, out uh, you know out after treatment. So uh, there is no water loss, I should say, between the front and the back end of the plant. Okay, and. Um... Is it suitable to use biosolids for agriculture due to the possibility of presence and of medication residuals? Okay, yeah. So, um, yeah, a great question. Um, <clears throat> so, the our biosolids um, it falls under a I think the rule is a five five hundred three rule on what it can be used for. So, the biosolids are not reused um, uh, in crops that that feed humans, if you will. They're, they're used in fodder crops. Uh, so they could be used for growing um, um, <clears throat> uh, grasses that are maybe fed to, to horses or, or to cat, uh, yeah, so horses. Um, they're also used for um, side of the roads, uh, all the ornamentation that we have on the side of the roads. Uh, once the biosolids have been um, properly composted, uh, then they can be used for those as well. So we don't use them for, for human, you know, human consumption, if you will. They are they are safely used, and it's heavily re regulated too. I might add, it's it's very heavily regulated. Okay, so we have two raised hands, so we'll we'll go there before we move on to the next part. Let's see, Ruby, did you want to ask your question? Ruby? Okay, if not, we'll have uh, Steve McLean. Did you wanna um, ask your question, Steve? Yes, my question is where does the clean water go once it's been cleaned? Oh, perfect. So yeah. that leads us to our next segment, which, uh, which Basil will start, so. Thank you, Genesis. <clears throat> Thank you, Steve. Um, uh, can everyone see me? Um, so thank you. Um, yeah, so we saw this this image in the beginning and uh, John, help me out with your cursor because we're utilizing John's slide. So um, the closed basin we talked about in the beginning of this virtual tour and you can see the full effect of it. So um, we have the Lancaster plant that John and um, Teresa given you a tour. So historically, so let's understand this is a closed basin the Lancaster plant back when it was started in the 1950s had very small flows, very low flows. But one of the things that's been the driver in the economy is Edwards Air Force Base. With Edwards Air Force being there, our populations increase. And this is Edwards Air Force Base right there. The plant sits about a mile from Edwards Air Force Base. And Edwards Air Force Base occupies like 23 square miles. And the low point in that valley is literally Edwards Air Force Base. So historically, when the flows were low, we could put it in what we call Amargosa Creek. I don't know, John, if you could point that out on the yeah. map. Right. It. Yeah, it's a dry wash and the water would go on it. It would evaporate or percolate. But as our flows <laughs> increased, it was starting to make its way onto Edwards Air Force Base. And if you look at the wetted area called Paiute Ponds, it was winding up on that dry lake bed, that dry area up to the top, that's Rosamond dry lake bed. And the Air Force was like, hey, you know, we're, we're good neighbors, but there's too much water coming on our dry lake beds because that's where we, we fly test um, aircraft or the another dry lake bed is where the shuttle would land if it couldn't land in, in um, Florida. So what we did in 1961, we built a dike along Avenue C. I don't know if John, John could point that out. We built a dike um, right along Avenue C. Yeah, go, yeah, to, yeah there. there it goes. It's called Sea Dike. And what that did was we were trying to keep the water off the lake bed. And what it did, it backed up the water and it created Paiute Ponds. Paiute Ponds are now about 400 acres of wetlands. That's a very important migratory bird stopping ground. Um, so about 4 million gallons a day goes to Paiute Ponds from Lancaster. Well, Population continues to grow. Edwards still doesn't want the, the water on the lake bed. So the next thing we did in the late 60s, 
we started taking some more water to Apollo Park. And so from the treatment plant, about six miles away, there's Apollo Park. And since 1972, it's been taking about a fifth of a million gallons of water a day to create Apollo Park. And we'll see close-ups of each of those sites. Well, the population continued to grow, more water. As the flows went up from 1 million to 10 million, now 15, we also, um, we built storage reservoirs. And you can see those four storage reservoirs there. And, um, and we have about 1.3 billion gallons of storage in those reservoirs because our edict from the regulators and from our good neighbors at the Air Force, and John's an Air Force guy, so I have to say he's, he's a good neighbor, um, <laughs> is to make sure no extra water goes on Air Force props. So we built those storage reservoirs and our flows continued to grow. And the last thing we did was purchase agricultural land about seven miles to the east so we can beneficially use this water. And so about, uh, about eight million gallons a day that um, goes to agricultural irrigation to grow fodder crops. And so that's, so what John and Teresa and all the folks at Lancaster, they have one of the most unique jobs in running a treatment plant. They not only have to clean up the water, but they have to make sure they account for every drop. You know, I, in the early part of this presentation, I talked about how we started as uh, to protect public health and the environment. Well, now we've transitioned to not only do that, but everything we produce, we want to turn it into a resource, such as the recycled water, the biosolids. And we want to show you how we're utilizing this recycled water. So next slide for me, John. So we're going to, this is an actual footage of Paiute Ponds on Edwards Air Force Base. Um, there are certain times of year, uh, I mean, every day you go there, you have to get access from Edwards Air Force Base. And on the physical tour, we would get a biologist from Edwards Air Force Base to drive us over there on a bus and we would get out and it's awe inspiring. You see all kinds of birds, um, all sizes from all over, either migrating or, or, or living locally right there in, this, in Paiute Ponds. Uh, next slide. But that recycled water also goes to Apollo Park that folks that live in Antelope Valley are aware of and you probably used, recreated there. And there's a lake there, there are three lakes there named after astronauts. And that's, that's spilled with water from the Lancaster plant. And I think there's even a fishing tournament there from time to time. And that gets about one fifth of a million gallons of water a day. Uh, next slide, John. Next. Um, but let's take a look at the, the storage reservoirs. This is the backstop. You're looking at a drone shot, 1.3 billion. And, and these storage reservoirs are, are key to what we do in terms of recycling because we're trying to reuse everything, but our demand is highest in the summer and in the winter, not so much. So um, our evaporation rates go down in the winter. Maybe it rains more in the winter, but we're still, we still have to keep the water of Edwards Air Force Base. So these reservoirs are key so we can, um, you know, John talks about daily changes in wastewater coming in. Well, you also have seasonal changes in how the recycled water is used. And so this allows us to smooth out the demand and the supply. So in the winter times, these reservoirs are closed uh, are, are full. And as, as it starts to warm up, we start drawing them down because the farmer, the park, even Paiute Ponds, because you get more evaporation. Um, next image for me, John. And here's what we've been doing since I don't know, about 15 years. We purchased about six square miles of land. We lease it to local farmers and they grow fodder crop. You're seeing an aerial shot of center pivot irrigation system. Can you point out the arm for me, John, and how it rotates like a clock arm. So it rotates and it creates those crop circles that you might see as you fly over middle America. And it's irrigating. It's a great way, easy way of irrigating crop. And then we'll have a close-up of it. We can see how the center pivot um, looks on the ground level. You see this wheel, um, it's, it's spinning, and then you have the nozzles that are hanging down from that arm and it's just slowly moving around and it's irrigating this crop. Yeah, and most of it is fodder crop. The, I think the only dairy left in LA County um, feeds their um, cattle with the fodder crop grown um, through this agricultural irrigation.
And the last use that we have of this recycled water, a lot of this, uh, some of it goes to the city of Lancaster. We have about at least 14 different sites that get recycled water from the Lancaster plant. And so it's like a yin and yang situation. The reservoirs and the ag are our foundation, but as more reuse pops up in the city, then we'll, we'll shunt more water there. And so that kind of tells you the whole story of how every drop is accounted for and the key is those reservoirs and the agriculture. Um, and we're trying to take this, this water and turn it into a resource in this semi-arid area. And so that, that's, that's my piece on the, what happens to the recycled water. Hopefully that answered all the questions, uh, the question you had on that. And we'll take questions. And John, don't go away. And Teresa, don't go away, because those folks are the expert. So Genesis, do we have any more questions? And you could probably even turn on your video <laughs> and put an active speaker so we can see everyone. Questions? So is the water that's coming out, is that clean enough to drink? It essentially meets drinking water standards, but California law doesn't allow us to drink it. But chemically, um, it, it's essentially drinking water standards. And there was also a question about the difference between a water reclamation plant and a treatment plant. When we talk about a water reclamation plant, we're talking about water that went through those three steps John talked about. The physical settling process, the biological treatment, and then filtration disinfection. Uh, that, that's a water reclamation plant. Treatment plant may only just give you primary, the, the, the physical and the biological treatment, and you didn't get the the filtering uh, uh, step. So that's how, that's a distinction we make. It, it treats the water where it's safe, but it's not safe where you can put it to more uses, which is what we're trying to do. Oh. And uh, do those storage reservoirs grow algae? And if so, how do you remove the algae? Um, John? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> we, don't, we don't see any algae in the, or at least very minimal amount of algae in those storage reservoirs themselves. Um, uh, they, they typically rise and fall, and 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 so I I don't remember seeing any uh, algae in there uh, in, in the in those uh, reservoirs that create any issues with the treatment process or in the process itself, I should say. Okay, how much does it generally cost to operate and maintain the facility every year? Um, the Lancaster plant is very similar to the Palmdale plant. The annual operation maintenance cost for the plants about between 10 and $11 million a year. Okay, and uh, do you know what the starting pH levels and ending levels are? Is this something that's constantly testing? That's constantly being tested? Um, yeah, we, we do have, we do monitor that on a regular basis. Maybe Teresa, you could, if you're able to uh, speak. I don't, I don't know if you happen to look at it lately or not. Is this microphone working? Yeah, um, yeah, we got okay, you. <laughs> um, yeah, it does get tested by our lab personnel every day. Um, and it's usually right ar uh, around nine, I believe, hmm. on the scale. I, I, I don't really know much about the, um, the, the testing part that the lab does, but they do test it every day. Okay, and how would higher or lower than normal pH levels affect the process and the environment? John, would you know that? <laughs> <laughs> you punted over to me. Um, so generally speaking, the, from what I recall uh, looking at, at some of those uh, metrics in the past, I haven't really seen a huge variance in the, in the pH going up or down or, or changing very much. Um, uh, so I, we haven't really seen that as an issue here at the plant itself. I, I, at least I don't recall any, any issues related to pH. Maybe, maybe you do, Teresa, but I certainly don't. No, I, I, we, I, like I said, we do monitor every day, especially in our digesters. And we can adjust um, the feed to the digesters if, the, if the, um, the pH is going up or down. We can either put more feed into it or less feed so that it can adjust itself. It, it pretty much adjusts itself through the, the biological process. Yeah, okay. and basically the pH of regular water. I mean, what, what comes out of the treatment plant is indistinguishable from your tap water. So whatever your tap water pH is, and if there's something that would change the pH um, severely, 
that's where the industrial waste inspectors would get involved. They would find what source is creating this change in pH, making either too acidic or too basic, and would work with that discharger to make sure that item is been taken out of the waste stream. Because we do want it, basically, you cannot tell the difference between tap water and this. And if there's something do it making that pH too low or too high, our industrial waste inspectors will be on the case. Yeah. Okay, and then uh, before we go on to the next questions, John, can you pull up the thank you slide again? Uh, yes. We have a few people um, that uh, want to get. So, um, so then the next question, let's see here. Maybe once you're, once you're ready. Um, did it come up or I thought it did, no? Share your screen. Oh, okay. Maybe I'm not doing something right here. Uh... And so people are asking if high schools and college science teachers are notified about these tours and presentations local city councils. Um, Basil, do you want to answer that? Um, yeah, I mean, we, we've been noted, we have a group of teachers in schools that we've worked with on um, over the years for physical tours. And so we've notified them, but any way you can get the word out, um, that would be appreciated. Um, you know, we, we think this is a very valuable um, resource because one of the things we're trying to get the next generation of, of treatment plant operators, engineers, chemists um, up and running. So these tours are, are good for the community, but also good for the lifeblood of the sanitation district. So any way you can spread the word would be much appreciated. Um, yeah. and, and what about the local city councils? Um, our city council, um, our board of directors are the mayors of the different cities. And, um, and so they're aware of the tours and the virtual tours and so on, so. Yeah. Okay. And, and if I can dovetail into that question also, just to add in, the district has a, uh, what's called sewer science program uh, for high school um, students. So if you're a teacher and uh, you, you wanna, you know, go more in depth on how a, a wastewater treatment plant goes through the treatment processes, uh, the district offers this, this course, you gotta sign up, it's, it's heavily in demand. So there is a, a little bit of a waiting list, um, but, in, but it works, we get a lot of really positive feedback from it. Uh, so, you know, and, and someone who come into a classroom like myself, you spend five days, uh, make, you make simulated wastewater, and then you treat it using actual microbes from the treatment plant itself. And then along the way, you also uh, perform some lab analysis like pH, uh, turbidity, um, uh, you check for BOD, which stands for biological oxygen demand. It's basically the amount of, you know, quote unquote, food that's in the water itself. And so you look at these different parameters. It's, it's, it's really, um, it's a really great lab. And the sanitation districts offers this to our, our, um, our communities. And John, you're working on trying to see if you can do it virtually while we're in this kind of, this mode, aren't you? Yeah, so I got I got to give the credit to to Wendy. She's the one who's really driving it. Um, <clears throat> um, she she has set this up virtually, and I think we've already gone through uh, one uh, testing of it. Um, it. We're trying different things uh, to, or, or we're working through some of those to to get it get it finalized. Um, I, and one of the biggest challenges, of course, is the the labs because this it's a very physically involved um, uh, process itself, and so. Uh, we want to do as much as we can to help the students and the, and the teacher in their classroom. But yes, uh, we do have a, a virtual uh, sewer science course that, that, that we have available. Yeah, we're trying to perfect it. And it's a new, yeah, trying to perfect it. Yeah. Okay, so um, we have Steve who has his hand raised. Um, Steve, did you want to ask your question? Steve McLean? Yes, my question is, the water that goes to the business world or to residential world, you said is not drinkable, but what does that water do? The recycled water? Yes. So we use it for agricultural irrigation. It goes to Apollo Park. And then at, at, um, at let's say the Kaiser building in Lancaster, it's used for irrigation of the, the landscaping, and it's also used in the, the restroom in terms of plumbing, if that answers your question. 
for some of the uses. Are there any other plans to expand that usability? Definitely, definitely. Um, that's where we have our um, reuse and compliance group and we have a water recycling coordinator um, that if you can, if you email us, we can get you in contact. Um, we also have like a lot of construction sites. They, there's a place where uh, vehicles can load up, uh, have tankers and load up with recycled water and use it at construction sites. So we're always looking for um, ways to add to the sites. I think we have a, a over 50 different sites in Lancaster that utilize recycled water on and off, but we're always looking for more because the more recycled water we use, the less imported water we need and it frees up our groundwater supply as well. Are there plans to be able to use this recycled water as drinking water for the public? Um, just hypothetically, I think there are plans. Um, I don't know if there are any specific plans um, or near-term plans, but I think that's that's kind of the future down the road I, I see in, in California and, and Los Angeles. But no near-term plans for this plant. I mean, I think they're, we're looking, yeah, I would say down the road. Yeah, but would require a higher level of treatment. Um, but we're not there yet for this particular plant. We have a, we have a project um, at our largest plant um, in Carson where we're working with the Metropolitan Water District where we've built with them, we've built a demonstration facility where um, they're purifying the water from that treatment plant, doing a bunch of testing on it, getting the regulatory approval. And if that goes well, and a Metropolitan Water District uh, gets their fund, uh, support of their board and funding, we could build a 150 million gallon per day purification facility down in the Southern part of the county. But that'd be the next step. Um, we're, we built a, a half a million gallon per day demonstration facility that's further purifying our clean water and see how that, that plays out. Thank you. Um, so our next question, um, is this final water tested for hormones, pharmaceuticals, and other chemicals? And I think we kind of... Yeah, it's tested. I'm not sure what there's, you know, we have to submit reports to the Lahontan Regional Water Quality Control Board. And there's a whole slew of constituents that are tested for. And I'm not, I don't know them off the top of my head. I couldn't. Uh, okay. Are the tanks made out of concrete and rebar? Is that it? Um, yes. Yeah. And so we also, some of the tanks are also lined with plastic to, to, um, protect those tanks as well. But yeah, it's concrete, uh, rebar, and then um, in some cases we line the tanks with with uh, like a plastic liner to protect it. And is the treatment plant able to filter out microplastics? I, I think uh -huh. I think most microplastics, we have a fact sheet that shows that most of the microplastics that could come in are settled out as it goes through the treatment process. I want to say 90 something percent. I, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but most of the microplastics are removed through the treatment process. I think it's in like the 99, 95 percent range, but I don't have those numbers. Um, we can get those numbers and we have a fact sheet on that. Do they, do people pay for our recycled water service, such as Kaiser? And yeah. if they do, do you know how much they pay? Or? Um, we negotiate the contract. Um, I'm not sure how much, but we, our water recycling group, our water recycling uh, coordinator, they'll negotiate a contract to make sure we recoup um, as much of our, our cost. Because the more money we get in recycled water with through sale of recycled water, it brings our rate down for the folks we serve, our rate payers. Okay, cool. And we have one hand up. And I don't know if I should, I wanted to do a poll. Um, I don't know if I should start that now or at the end. Your call. Okay. No um, pressure. <laughs> so we, we, have a, we have a poll. We would love to get, um, you know, all of your feedback. <clears throat> Um, for the poll to help us improve future ones. We're still going to keep answering questions, but um, if you could just take 
take the poll. So I'll I'll launch it, but um, while we go through the other questions. Um, okay, so Fran, Fran had her hand up. Let's see, she she joined us. Let's see, Fran, did you wanna ask your question? Uh, I have two questions. Uh, first of all, is how is our water protected from sabotage? Secondly, my second question is the recycled water, uh, is that reserved uh, in any uh, reservoirs for fires? Um, sabotage, first question. Um, that, that's where our industrial waste inspectors come in. Um, they're always at the lab, as um, Teresa and John mentioned. Um, we, we're all, there's a lab there. We're collecting samples of the wastewater coming in. And if we find something that would be problematic or dangerous, um, then our inspectors will then start trying to track where that came from. So we're always checking um, what's in our wastewater coming in. Okay. Uh, okay. Now, and then their second, what was the second question? Um, uh, my second question is, uh, do you uh, keep some of the reclaimed water in reservoirs to be used for fires? Um, I think it can, but I'm not sure. I know if uh, uh, construction sites can get recycled water, so I don't see, I'm not sure why it couldn't be used for fire suppression, but I'm not an expert. I'd have to look into that. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Um, so moving on, we have, uh, let's see. Yvonne, I'm sorry, it says, I'm trying to unmute. We have another raised hand, but it says Yvonne um, can't use the unmute. So where does the Lancaster Water Reclamation Plant get money? And Yvonne, sorry, you can put your question in the Q&A. Sorry, but um, yeah, where does the Lancaster Water Reclamation Plant get its money? Okay, so we work for the public. And so the way we're funded, um, we get a small amount of property tax um, um, and but the vast majority of the money comes from what we call service charge so if you have a home or you own a property a piece of property and you discharge a sewer system you pay um, based on how much wastewater you generate so if you if you have a car wash you'll generate more wastewater than a single family home so you'll pay more so uh, we get most of the money revenue comes from um, service charge. So if you discharge to the sewer system, you pay a fee that's used to operate the system. If you're on a septic tank, for example, where nothing is discharged to the sewer system, then you would pay nothing. But it basically comes from the users of the system. Did I answer that question? Okay. Um, where does that compacted waste go when it's filtered out? I think from the beginning of the process. That John was talking about. Oh yes, so uh, you, you you're probably referring to that bin uh, that's over there by the screening structure. So that ends up in uh, being landfilled is where it goes. So uh, one uh, maybe a couple times a week, I think the uh, waste management comes in and they pick up the bin and, and then it's landfilled. Okay, um, is oh this one's for Teresa. What is a wastewater treatment plant operator's worst nightmare? Um, I would have to say probably a power outage or a power dip. And the reason is, is even though we have these three huge diesel generators that will run our whole plant, when the power dips or is turned it, or it goes out, most of our processes do not restart automatically. So we actually have to physically go through the plant um, open valves for air so that when we turn the, um, the, um, the process air compressors back on, it doesn't blow out the system with too much air going through it. Um, we have to go through and um, reset all the faults on all the different um, pumps and, and whatnot. So it, it's, it takes a couple hours to get the plant up and running. So um, probably a power outage. <laughs> cool, thank you. Um, so, is there any recycled water that it that isn't used or sold? Um, most of the water at the treatment plant is um, is used either for pilot ponds or agriculture. Maybe a small sliver, and um, 
And I guess one of the, there was a question earlier about how much water comes in and how much water goes out. Um, this plant was upgraded to that activated sludge that John showed you, I don't know, a couple of years ago. I want to say nine, ten years ago. But previously, we used to use what we call oxidation ponds, which are like big lakes. And so we would lose a lot of water through evaporation. But now the footprint of the treatment plant is smaller, so we don't lose as much water. Um, but I would say most of what comes in gets reused. The very, very, like less than a percent may not, may, we may lose to evaporation. Okay, um, is there any way that we can get that water for homes to water their backyards? Um, that's part um, of a distribution system, and I'm not sure, again, talking to our water recycling coordinator. So we, we have a, a, a purple pipe distribution system that the city of uh, Lancaster um, is developing, and then um, when they approach us, then we put it in that system. But I, what can residents do to help other than um, not flushing their wipes down the drain? Um, also, uh, John, you want to go? Oh, yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's, yeah. So that, thank you for asking that question. And so um, not flushing the wipes down the drain, not, not uh, or the toilet. Also any, um, uh, you know, cloth material. Um, basically, you just, what you want to put down there is, uh, only thing you want to let to go down there is something that may be organic or something that will um, uh, basically easily be de destructible like toilet paper in itself. Uh, so those are the types of things that you want. You don't want to put in, you know, um, you know, anything hard like the, the flushable wipes themselves down. I can help it. I don't know, you, you have anything else you can add or want to add Basil or uh, Teresa? Yeah, I, I, Teresa, yeah. Um, no, I, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's probably the biggest thing. Nine percent of the stuff that we get are those flushable wipes. Yeah. yeah. And in, in regards to the medication, Genesis always likes to talk about household hazardous waste roundup. So now it's an opportunity to plug how they can play their role. Yes. So our household hazardous waste and electronic roundups um, are a free way for residents in LA County to dispose of all their household hazardous and electronic waste. And if you go, and I'll put it on the chat. Uh, if you go to www.lacsd.org slash HHW, you'll see all the roundups coming up in your area. We do have a permanent one in Palmdale that's open every first and third Saturday of the month. So again, whether you have paints, uh, which will never go down the drain, um, prescribed drugs or um, fluorescent light tubes, batteries, old computers that you want to get rid of, all of that, a way to proper dis properly dispose of it is by going to one of the roundups. And again, it's free of charge, no questions asked, just show up. Um, and right now with COVID precautions, we're only taking items from the trunk or the back of your car. So just show up and we'll take, we'll take all of that out of your hands. And if you have any questions, you can uh, send an email to info at lacsd.org. So, uh, the next question, this is from Larry Furukawa, which is, um, I recognize that name. <laughs> okay. Uh, for employee restrooms, do you use recycled water to flush the toilets? No. I, I, at the Lancaster plant, we don't. We actually have um, well water that we use for potable water. It's not drinkable, but it, we do use it for um, the restrooms. Cool. Um, and then this one, is treated water also used to recharge local aquifers, Basil? Um, we, in the southern part of LA County, um, we use, um, most of the recycled water is used to uh, recharge aquifers in the Pico Rivera, uh, Long Beach type area. And we've been doing that since 1962. Out in the Antelope Valley, um, since it's such a, an arid or semi-arid semi area, most of that water is spoken for either for agriculture or Paiute Ponds or Apollo Park. So we don't do much recharge or any, pretty much any recharge in Antelope Valley. Most of the recharge we do with our other um, treatment plants are down in the southern part of the county. And 
with current climate change concerns about releasing methane into the atmosphere, how do the sanitation districts manage its production of methane? Um, yeah, so maybe I can respond to that. So on the <clears throat> methane that gets produced through the digesters themselves, that is collected and it's uh, uh, monitored and it's uh, any excess methane is destructed through um, uh, through flares that we have. And, and all that's, we keep track of everything and, and it, it's regulated as well. And so, uh, as you know, green, uh, methane is a greenhouse gas. And so we do not want to just arbitrarily release it into the atmosphere. So we do manage that as well. All right, thank you. Um, so, um, all right, so thank you everyone for taking the poll. Uh, John, there's a request if you can go back to the beginning slide, the first slide. Sure. Title slide. Um, but again, thank you everyone for coming to today's tour. We hope we asked all of your questions. If there's any follow up or a question that you think of later on in the week, um, you can send an email to info at lacsd.org. I put it in the chats down below. Take the poll, John. Huh? Take the poll. <laughs> Take the poll. Oh, okay. Yeah, All right. Click, click X on that. There you go. <laughs> All right, well, at least you see the poll anyways. Um, so we can see the, the title slide. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a little bit slow. This is a big file, by the way. Um, and so it was really dragging down on my system. Yeah, it's, it's freezing up on me here. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, it's, it's frozen. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, I think I will. Uh, you, I will are you able to bring it up, Genesis? Or yeah, uh, I'll bring it. I'll bring it up right now. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's, it's frozen over here. Yeah, we, so on these, these virtual tours, we like to have as much video and pictures and stuff like that as we can. And, um, you know, there's a lot to talk about at Lancaster. So our, it, the file is pretty huge. Yeah, I'll start sharing right now. And, well, there you go. So perfect. I'll leave that on for about 15 seconds and then, and then uh, we will end today's broadcast. So there are no more questions, Genesis? There were no more questions, no. All right. Thank you, Genesis. Thank you, John. Thank you, Teresa. And thank you to the over 200 people that tuned in. Hopefully this was a good experience and pretty informative. Please, please spread the word. We give these tours to, for groups and students. So spread the word that this resource is there. And just thank you for spending a Saturday morning with our stars, John, Teresa, and Genesis. And Basil. I'm, I'm Genesis. You're a star too, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thank you, everybody. We really do appreciate this. Yeah. We do it again.